fine because you knew that the acceleration was the 70 minus 0 over 11 minus 0. And you got the 6.36. Some of you put 6.4 meters per second squared. Either one was acceptable. Um, and then, how far did it go? A lot of you got 770 meters. No, 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 no. Because remember, it started from rest. So the distance would have been how far it went. It was actually equal x equals v naught t, where v naught is equal to 0, uh, plus the 1 half a t squared. And then there's actually a handful of students who forgot who were having test anxiety or something. And, when they were taking down their notes, forgot to square the T also. Um, so it came out to be 385. Or you could have said that X was equal to the average velocity times time. And the average velocity, which was the next question, is 70 plus 0 divided by 2, which is 35 meters per second. And this one would have, gotten you th would have gotten you 385 meters. And then... Um, I added those other two questions. OK, say so it goes for another five seconds. How much faster is it going to be going then? Well, it's adding about 6.4 meters per second per second. So in those extra five seconds, it's going to add um, the, the velocity will gain 5 times 6.356, but it, but it started at 70. So it came out to be about 101. So you could have said, well, the final velocity is equal to v naught plus a times t, where v naught was 70 plus the 6.36 times the 5. And that came out to be 101 or 102 meters per second. Either one I took. <coughs> so you just got this. And I didn't take all five off. I said, OK, you got for that second part. But remember, that it's already going 70 meters per second before you get there. Um, and then what's the displacement? Again, you can just go back to this one. Some of you um, did it with just the five seconds and used this as 70 times 5 plus 1 half, 6.36 times 5 squared. And I accepted that answer. I went, OK. It was kind of vague that I'll take that. And then some of you started from the very beginning and went x equals um, 0 times t plus 1 half 6.36 times 16 squared. Then that would give you the overall displacement. Some of you kind of got it mixed up. You put an 11 here or a 5 here and started this with 0 and didn't quite get the whole thing, but you were on the right track. Now, page 2. I was troubled by page two because that caused people all kinds of heartache so it was something I probably didn't go over very well. All right. All right. So if I've got two vectors, I'm just going to do some simple vector addition here. Vectors is uh, 4.0x minus 2.0y hat, right? Was, wasn't that one of them? And b was equal to 1x plus 5y hat. All right. Now, the first problem was, I just wanted you to tell me what the magnitude and direction was of each of these two vectors, OK? Um, and so the magnitude of this vector, which is this, is equal to 4 squared plus 2 squared. Well, negative 2 squared. Some of you, <coughs> some got the square root of 12. No, 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 no. When we square, when we square this guy in here, he becomes positive. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 2. So I get the square root of 20. That's his magnitude. And his direction is this, um, the 2 over 4. And you can make it negative 2 over 4 if you want. And you might get a bigger angle. But where is that? It's actually going to be that angle in, four, in the fourth quadrant right here. Because he's 4, he's going over 4, and down 2. And you do a similar thing to the other one. Now, if I'm going to add A and B, I just do this and add them up. And I get 5.0x hat plus 3y hat. And then when we, ask for the, when we want the magnitude, we do the same thing again. So this is our resultant vector. So the magnitude of this guy 
is equal to 5 squared plus 3 squared, <coughs> which is square root of 34, which is uh, 5.8 something. And again, if we want the direction, theta is the inverse tangent of 3 over 5, whatever that comes out to be. Okay. All right, now, and on the other one, when we do b minus a, where b is equal to 1 plus 5 minus a, here's a, so we're going to subtract a, so we're going to take the opposite of what a is. We're going to take minus 4 and plus 2 then, because there's minus a. And this would be negative 3 uh, plus 7. Now, if you got this far, I gave you two points for that, this far, but the, it asks for the magnitude again. So the magnitude would be 3 squared plus 7 squared, the square root of that, which is 49 plus 9 is 58. So it's 7 something. And then the direction again is the inverse tangent of. 7 over 3. And the quadrant would be, on this one, it's negative 3 and positive 7. So it's over here in the second quadrant. All right. And then the last one was we had, we wanted to find a vector of b so that a plus b plus c is equal to 0. Well, here's a plus b is 5 and 3. So to make this guy's 0, then vector c should just equal minus 5x hat minus 3y hat. That was it. Just seeing if you understood what is meant by the vector and its components. That one, that one caused people some trouble. So I don't think I went over it enough then or something. All right. Um, then, the good old stone thrown vertically. Okay, stone thrown um, vertically. This one was a killer too. This one killed people too. A lot of people drew a nice diagram, 17 meters per second, it's going this way, and is 20 meters high, it's off here at 20 meters. So this would be at plus 20, and this is at zero down here. All right, now, we wanted to know how long it was in the air, and people went, okay, I can do this, because I know that y, it's going to be zero. I, a lot of people were on track, they're going, okay, zero equals 20. Yes, that's our y naught, because um, y final is going to equal 20, and y naught is equal to, or equal to 0, and y naught is equal to 20. It's going to equal y naught plus some v naught t minus 1 half g t squared. All right. Everyone was tracking. A lot of people missed this one, because you know what happened? They went, Ooh, they let v naught equal 17 meters per second. Well, what's wrong with that? It's a common, common mistake when you're first introduced to this, to make this mistake. And the mistake is that this guy is an x component. We're dealing with y's here. And the v naught y is equal to 0, so there isn't a guy there. So it actually turns out to be a nice, easy, uh, a much easier problem. And so you wind up with 4.9 t squared equals 20. And so t is, uh, when you do this, t comes out to be about 2.02 .02 seconds. I accepted two seconds. <coughs> and then how far it went on the next part, the range of it, is just, oh, we threw it at 17 meters per second. That never changes because it has no acceleration because all the acceleration is in gravity in the y component. So it's just this 17 times 2. It comes out to be 34 meters per second. 
And then the last one was, what velocity, oh, 34 meters, not 34 meters per second. Then the last one was, what velocity does it finally hit the ground? Some of you got, would have gotten the, if it had been multiple choice, you would have gotten the answer right, but you did it for all the wrong reasons. Um, you, we can't, we can say that the final velocity in the y direction is equal to um, the initial velocity squared minus 2g times um, 0 minus 20. So that becomes 40g. Vfy squared equals uh, 40 times g. And so Vfy then equals uh, 19.8, I think, meters per second. Some of you put 17 squared in here. and got 17 squared plus this guy and then took the square. No, 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 no. Can't do that because you're mixing and mushing again. X's and Y components. We can't do that. So the final velocity then would be V naught X squared plus this uh, V final Y squared. And take the square root of that. And you get 26.1. And the bizarre thing is it comes out to be real close to if you put the 17 squared in here and just solve that one. If I added 17 squared to that one. Well, yeah, of course it would. But you can't mix and mush your X and Y components. All right, last big problem was problem four. All right. And this one confused people, I think, because it's probably bad pedagogy on my part by saying, hey, if we've got a, uh, <coughs> if we have, Um, something that's going 30 meters per second this way vertically and 40 meters per second horizontally then the initial thing here is 50 because it's 30 squared plus 40 squared square root equals 50 meters per second is the initial velocity of this thing. Now I want to make something clear here. When you're taking an exam, luckily the exams aren't worth all that much because I know they're killers and you spend a lot of time on your homework and in labs so that's why those um, comprise most of the uh, grade. But when you're taking a test, if you don't understand the question, please ask. All right? and I'll point you in the right direction. If you're confused by the wording or something, if you're like, what, what do they mean by this? Oh, they just mean this. Oh, okay. I can get it from here. All right, um, now for the projectile to re, do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so would that be a three, four, five? Yeah, it's basically a three, four, five triangle. Yeah, because I get 1,600 or 900 plus 1,600 is 2,500. Take square root of it, I get 50. Yep. Yep, yep. All right. And so the, the next question was, hey, how high does this thing go? Again, we had, we had uh, people would find, found 50, and they wanted to do this. They wanted to say, okay, they were, they were real good that the final velocity at the maximum height, the final, the final velocity in the y direction at the maximum height is going to equal zero. That was good. But the problem was they said that this was, that was a common mistake. No, 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 no. It's 40. And we didn't have to find any of the angles or anything this time. It, that was. And so to find that time then is pretty easy because you've got VFY equals V naught Y minus GT. Oh, we know this guy. This guy's 0 equals 40 minus GT. And so T came out to be about. Uh, 4.1 seconds or something like that. <coughs> That's to get to the maximum height. And then, so how high did it go? Oh, well, if it, um, let's see, to get, the, to get the height, we go y equals y naught, which is 0, 
plus 40 times 4.1 minus 1 half g 4.1 squared. Now that's about 16, that's about 8 times 9, and this is 40 times, which is 72 something, and this is about 160, so it's right around like 81 or 82 meters, something like that. That's the way it came out. And again, if you put 50 in for this guy, I just took a few points off because you're on the right track. You had the, you had the right formula for the right thing, and I knew what you were doing, but you got to keep the components straight. What's X and what's Y? That's what was killing most people on the same because it was new to you and you had all these formulas. It seemed like there's just, we're just bombarding you with all these um, formulas. And those of us that do this for a living think, well, there's only like two big ideas, but you all are seeing hundreds of formulas. And so that, there's the disconnect. And so we're trying to... Um, so, so that's why this stuff is hard. It is. And this takes practice. All right. Uh, then the last one, then, then I think there was the range. You had to find the range of the thing. Well, if this is the time it took to get to the maximum height, then its total time in air was equal to 8.2. Some of you, or 8.16 or something like that, uh, some of you did this. You, it was real good. You did, well, zero equals 0 plus 40 times t minus 4.9 t squared and solve this guy um, and when you solve this you get uh, 4.9 t squared equals 40 the t's cancel so you wind up with t equals 40 over 4.9 um, Yeah, which is about eight. Right, that'd be t squared. Wait a minute. Okay. What's that? Oh, oh, that. There, there we go. Thank you. Oh my. Whew. I knew I was. There we go. Now we can divide out one t, and that's the t that represents zero. And then we get t equals 40 over 4.9. See, it even happens to the best of us sometimes. There we go. 8.2s. Thank you, Don, for bailing me out there. All right. And so then the total time it was, so the range would be the x velocity times 8.2. Now, the next question was the killer question. What is at the maximum height? What is its velocity? As it's going like this, when it's right here, it still has that 30 meters per second going that way. We get, I think the problem is we teach you in chapter two straight up and down. And we, we kind of beat that into your head. You throw something straight up, when it reaches its maximum height, its velocity is zero for a split second. But when we're going in two dimensional, remember, this started off at 40, and started up and had 30 going this way, but the problem was there's no acceleration acting on that 30. We're neglecting any kind of air resistance or anything, so that 30 stays with it the whole time, whereas the gravity monster eats up this 40 meters per second. And so right here, Vy, v, Vy is equal to zero, but v, v not x is still there. Still tr trucking along at 30 meters per second. And then the last question was, how much, kind of got this test memorized. You grade 181 of them. You've got it memorized for the most part. Um, the, uh, well, oh, what happens with the gravity? What happens with the gravity at this, or the acceleration? Well, the acceleration is always downward. Acceleration never goes away. All right, and that's another test anxiety thing. You start, you, you start reading the question, you forget what acceleration means, you get it confused with velocity when this is brand new to you, and you go, oh, I think it's zero again. That's that zero thing that he kept talking about. Um, no, it's acceleration, and the acceleration of gravity never leaves us. We never all of a sudden just start floating or anything like that. It's always 
here and it's always going down. Okay. So, the hard part is all this algebra and then keeping it all straight and then the language and, and knowing the difference between acceleration and velocity and the difference between velocity and speed and displacement and all that kind of stuff. All right. And then the last three bonus questions, well, the last three questions, you um, graded two out of three of them. Uh, complete the following. The term net force most accurately describes E, the quantity that changes the velocity of an object. Because when you change the velocity of an object, over time, that's an acceleration. So F equals MA. And then uh, question five, which one of the following terms is used to indicate the natural tendency of an object to rain, remain at rest or in motion at a constant speed along a straight line? That's good old inertia. And the way we measure an inertia is by mass <coughs> with our kilograms. Now it says complete the following statement. An inertial reference frame is one in which Newton's first law is valid. That was kind of like the bonus question. That's, it was A. So the, the questions on those go E, E, A. Or, yeah, E, E, A. Okay. Now, if you did horribly on this, you, have, you can come back. All right? Because I've, what I've found is that this first test is always a disaster for the most part. If you did well on it, well being 70 and above, then you're okay. Um, if you did horribly on it, whatever your standards are, um, trust me, it'll be okay. Um, it's a weird thing because whenever you take a math or science class, I've always found this, especially in a math class. I don't know so much about science, but it seems like you struggle and struggle with something and then, uh, well, let's just take calculus. When I took Calc 1, I struggled and struggled, got through it. Then when I was taking Calc 2, I was like, God, Calc 1 is the easiest thing in the world. Okay? Same thing's going to be with this. Once we go on to some new stuff, this old stuff that we just did that seemed hard, you're going to be like, oh, boy, I wish I could retake that test again. I'd ace it now. So everything will be okay. All right? And then plus, we're going to get into some other things. We're going to get into heat. And we're going to get into um, energy and things like that. And so some of this, this is always the hardest one for everybody. All right, so what I'm saying is, hang in there. It'll be okay. All right, and it's only 5%, so keep coming, keep taking the quizzes, and do your labs. Since I've been overhearing conversations that labs are being problematic sometimes, I will talk to Dr. Robel about that. Okay. All right. Let's talk about four. Let's talk about chapter four for here. About well, any questions on the test? Anything? Yes, Laura. Remember you asked for direction that also includes angle. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. See, uh, boy, um, that was missed by a lot of people. With that direction means the angle. Yeah, because a lot of people get oh, it's going north and west. Okay, yeah, that's, no, I need the angle. Remember, what we do in physics is we put a number to things. That's why physicists are alive, is so that they can figure out something and put a number on it. All right, so, so I'm a good qualitative guy. North of west means something to me. I know what that means, but a physicist wants to know, well, how many degrees north of west? All right. Um, but you shouldn't have gotten, I think that's the only thing you missed, as I recall. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, not to throw Laura's stuff out in Front Street there, but anyway. Okay. Um, let's talk about forces. All right. Now, let's talk about Newton's third law. Let's start with Newton's third law because we've already talked about the first and second law. First law says for an object, that was like one of the questions on your test. An object in motion is going to stay in motion unless acted upon by a net external force. <coughs> I like using the word external there because there's got to be forces working on the outside of, on, outside of it, okay? In other words, um, 
I'll save that example for later. Okay, so if we got a ball moving along, then all of a sudden, oh, let's just use that. We've got a ball moving along, nice constant velocity, a little softball here being pitched, nice constant velocity of 30 meters per second, about 60 miles an hour, or I don't know, how fast can they pitch a softball? About that? So some of the girls I've seen can really crank it. But anyway, so it's going about, oh, 25 meters per second. Pitcher's mound is about 18 meters away, so you've got less than a second to decide whether you like that pitch or not. You do like it, you whack it, and so you changed its direction, all right? It wanted to keep going straight, but gravity's pulling it down so it sinks, and the bat, when it hits it, sends it the other way, okay? All right, so that's first law. Second law says, all right, let's just go... We can't teach physics unless we have blocks sliding on inclined planes. There's no other way to do it. At least we haven't thought of, we haven't been creative enough to come up with other ways to do it. There's an external force. There's a net external force on something that um, will get it to move. If that is a frictionless plane, if there's no friction pushing back, by the way, little f like this is friction. If this force equals this force, now the friction, got a question for you. Is the friction part of the block or is that a contact force on the block? That's a contact force on the block, right. So, so the block is not pushing um, back. This frictional force is not the block pushing back. That's what I'm getting to. We're going to get to the third law here in a minute. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But right now, let's, just, let's include friction because that's what we're used to. So I've, I'm pushing this way, and F is going this way. So right now, let's say F is equal to uh, the net forces in the X direction here is F is positive minus F equals zero. That block's not moving. Now, let's get to some of the forces in the x-direction. Let's make f bigger. There. Got f to be bigger. All right? So f is really pushing. The frictional forces are still the same. The frictional forces won't change. Okay? Frictional forces are set, determined by the, by the weight and the material of that box. Minus F. Ooh, guess what happens now? It's a net external force that's being applied, right? That's positive in this thing. So therefore, we got the mass of this block, and it accelerates. So the mass, so it accelerates going that way. So it's got an acceleration. That's Newton's second law, OK? That a net external force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Or that he words it differently, but, but that's, that's the second law. Now the third law is where people get confused between the second and the third law. Third law says, if I'm going to push on this box with a big force like this, what's the box doing? Let's just look at the internal force of the box. If I push on this guy with a big F, what's this box do? He pushes back with the same F. Okay? Forces all never act alone. All right? But you might be going, well, wait a minute. So what's getting it to move at all? Ah. This, is this force right here acting on the block or acting on whatever's pushing it? It's acting on whatever's pushing it. So this doesn't enter in. This is not a part of the second law equation. Okay? It's not a part of the second law equation. But for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Forces always work um, in pairs. Now, let's go through... He's got a pretty good 
idea on the slideshow here of this thing. Then you guys are eyes are going to really glass over because oh yeah I forgot I could lower it from over there. Um, we're going to talk about free body diagrams on this stuff. All right. So. I don't know why I don't turn this on at a time. Okay. All right. Here's Newton's third law of motion. Okay? It says for every force or action, there's an equal and opposite force or reaction. Alright, so notice how they say it. So the force of one on two is equal to the opposite of the force on two caused by one. Alright? Uh, the force of two on one. Alright? So, note that the action and reaction forces act on different objects. Okay, so here, I've got mg, is this the block acting? Is this the force of the block acting? What's causing this force right here? Gravity, the earth, the big old earth down here at the bottom of the, that we don't see. That's what's causing this mg. That's not the force of the, uh, that's not the force of the, the, that the block is pushing down. And so this mg force is being counteracted by what we call the normal force. That's coming up here. This is the this is the table pushing back um, on the block. Okay, shows a block exerts a downward force on a table. The table exerts an equal and opposite force on the block called the normal force. All right, so all right. Okay, because the but actually the opposite force of this mg is down here on the earth getting pulled up by that block, but it's so, its mass is so much less than that of the uh, block that the Earth kind of stays still. So, yeah? Um, so what exactly is pushing up? Like, what is the force? Is it the opposite of gravity? What is, what is the force that's pushing up on the block? The table. I mean, what's pushing, like, the table by itself, or is it something exerted force on the table that's pushing up the block? Okay, good. Block's pushing down. Gravity's causing the block to push on the table. All right? So the opposite force is the table pushing back. There's the table. Yep. Just the table. All right. And they're contact forces. The, the, this, the force that's act, the external force that's causing this, this is the force at a distance caused by the earth, okay, which is giving the block weight, which the table feels, okay. This is like if I hold, I hold in my hand, this book, all right? Oh, ripped the page, got all excited. All right, now, if I just, hold on a second, I don't want to lose my place. All right, so I hold it like this, all right? So I can feel that book pushing down on my hand, and that's being caused by the force of gravity, it's actually, but the weight of the book is pushing on my hand, and my hand is equally pushing up on the book, all right? Okay. Yeah, it's kind of tricky. It's kind of tricky. But when we start doing actual problems and figuring out accelerations, tensions, and all that kind of stuff, we're doing second law. All right? Yes? So it's safe to say that, for example, an elevator, when they build it to hold a, a, a maximum capacity, they're building it to exert enough force that whatever gets pushed down at their building is to push up the For example, if someone really big this on the table, and the table breaks, that's because the force the table has is not greater than the force that was exerted on it? No, the table's pushing up with the same amount of force, but the net external forces are strong enough to accelerate that person down through it. Okay? Because what's caught, it's a net external force of that person pushing down on the table, and it's going, hey, I'm not, it's just like, these are excellent questions that McKinnon was asking because it, it does. You, you sit there and you, and you think about it. You go, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. If I push on this chair, it's pushing back. Then why is it moving? 
for crying out loud. Okay? Well, the reason is, when I push on this chair, this is an external force. The chair pushing back is an internal force. Okay? So, therefore, ergo, the external, but as long as my external force pushing this way is um, not greater than the frictional forces on the wheels pushing back that way, then this chair is not going to move. But as soon as this net external force that I apply is greater than that frictional force pushing back, then the chair will move. Even though it's pushing back with, even if I push it with 10 newtons, or I push it with 20 newtons, it's still going to push back with 20. All right? But if I only push it with 5, that may not be enough to counteract the frictional forces pushing back. Make sense? Or did I oversell it? Now I've confused you. Probably one or the other. Probably both. A little of both. All right. Okay. And now that it's recorded out there for millions to see, I'll probably get all kinds of emails from physics teachers saying, you screwed that up. All right. All right. So anyway. All right. So let's take a look at these pairs of forces. Newton's third law. The action-reaction forces for a person carrying a briefcase. This is the one time that I really kind of like the old book. And I'll give you an example from the old book so that you can kind of, now, nah, we'll just use this one. All right, okay. Now, the force of the hand pushing up on the briefcase, okay, then the briefcase is pushing down on the hand. Okay, we got that action reaction force, that's a piece of cake. All right, now, this is gravity pulling down on the briefcase. This is the briefcase pulling up on the earth. Okay, there was the, that's the action-reaction pair. Now then, though, for the second law, Newton's second law, I would say that this system, this hand briefcase system, is in equilibrium because I'm looking at the external forces, not the internal forces, but the net external forces. Okay, this one. I disregard because that's the, that's the briefcase acting, pulling up on the earth. Now then, my hand is pulling up on the briefcase. This one I disregard for the second law because it's the internal force. It's the one that the briefcase is doing on the hand. Okay? And then I've got F2, which is an external force caused by the earth pulling it down. Okay? Which is just as real. You can just think of gravity as, as grabbing it and pulling on it too even though it's action at a distance. So my external forces are F1 and F2. So if I added up these forces, I'd say the sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to F1, which is positive, minus F2 equals zero. All right? But now when I go over here and I drop it, this force goes away. Now my net external forces are unbalanced, so it accelerates down. You see that? That's why I, I kind of like this diagram. It, it shows, okay, right now it's in equilibrium, and all the action-reaction pairs are all paired up. Okay? But when I draw the free body diagram, when I'm actually trying to find the acceleration of this thing, I'm only going to look at the net external forces. The external forces is hand on the briefcase, holding it up, earth on the briefcase, pulling it down. This is internal, this is, uh, that's, the, that's, a, that's the force on the earth. I don't care about the force on the earth, because I'm not working, that's out of my system. I'm not doing the earth, I'm just looking at the briefcase. Okay? I could figure out what the acceleration is on the earth, but basically what I'd be doing is dividing the mass of this, divided by the mass of the earth. Or I take, basically, it's going to be the mass of that briefcase divided by the mass of the Earth. That's going to be the acceleration, roughly. That's kind of dinky. Okay. All right. <coughs> so, anyway, plus I'm going to multiply it by 6 times 10 to the negative 11th also. But anyway, so now I drop it. So now there's no more force on the briefcase going up. So the net external force, F2, is going down. So therefore, my free body diagram just shows that one force pulling it down, the net external force. So I got the sum of the forces in the y direction equals negative mg, because it's going down. OK? 
okay, where M is the mass of the briefcase. All right. Okay. All right. Good. Good, good, good. I think we've... And I'll be honest. I've taught this stuff for several years now, and I'm just now getting it. All right. Just now, I, I used to just, I, I was able to fake my way through because I'm real good in math. And the, could just go, okay, I, I kind of know what's supposed to go. But now to actually explain it to somebody or to try and explain it to you all, you got to really know it. And I think I've got it down finally. So, yes? Is it common to screw up? Um, yes. Gravity? <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, like, apply gravity too much to it all. Oh, let's do some problems. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it, the common mistake that people make is they forget, they, 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 they get involved and they think, well, well, nothing should ever move then if there's an, always an action-reaction force. So what's going on here? Where is the action-reaction? Action, Earth pulling it down, reaction, this pulling up on the Earth. Who wins? The Earth. It's not moving. It's not going anywhere because of this little dinky thing. Okay? So, that, so there's, there's the action-reaction here. But the net external forces, if we're just looking at the briefcase, that system is down. <coughs> All right. Good. Oh, free body diagrams. Everybody's favorite. Here we go. For the next 13 minutes, I'm going to torture you with a very important thing. All right. So we're going to do this. We're going to just do two problems to start because I think you all look like you've had a kind of shell shock today anyway. So that'll be enough. All right. I'm going to try and go with the example in the book, but the example in the book started off way too hard. I was like, you're killing me. You're killing me. Um, let's just start. Let's find the acceleration and the tension. This is classic physics 101, all right? The Atwood's machine, everybody's favorite thing, all right? So here we go. We're just going to look at an Atwood's machine to start. I've got a 5 kilogram mass over here. And I've got a 1.5 kilogram mass over here. All right. Let's start drawing in some forces on this thing. First of all, I'm going to tell you something right now, that this pulley has no friction. There's no friction in that pulley. Now, you might be going, well, how the hell does it work if it doesn't have friction? Well, it doesn't very well. All right? In other words, this thing is um, allowed, it's, it's almost a frictionless pulley. All right? So, it's, it's, so these blocks are allowed to slide around. Okay? Now, second thing is there's no mass in the rope, and it doesn't stretch. Okay? It's a stretchless, massless spring, and Eric is already going, okay, we're in la-la land again. That never really happens. Correct. But we've got to start somewhere. Okay? So now, let's start drawing in the forces. I've got a tension going up this way. What's another force? Anyone? Gravity. Which, on which one? Both. Yes. I've got... This would be 5G going down this way, and I've got 1.5G going down this way. There's another force in there. What's that? On the other rope, there's a tension. Is it going up or down? Up. Okay. Quick question for you. Is that tension going to be the same as this tension? Yes. How said yes. So I'm going to go with him. All right? All right. So there's, there it is. We're done. 
with uh, with our diagram we got one important thing left we got it this thing I got a question for you is this thing going to stand still is it going to be in equilibrium and just sit there no Mr. Corwright says no which way was it going to do yeah it's going to go down the five kilogram so your intuition is correct it will go like this it will come crashing down like this it's going to flip this 1.5 up in the air like that right so which way is it accelerating for this guy which way is he's accelerating down so you, you go ahead and draw your acceleration here what about him up are those A's the same is he going to accelerate up at the same uh, acceleration as he goes down Yes, otherwise you got the slinky thing again, all right? Okay, so now, here's what we do. Here's the classic problem, and I'll tell you what, on your next test, you're going to get this problem. You're going to get an Atwood's machine, and you're going to tell me you're going to have to figure out what the tension and what the acceleration is, all right? I promise you. Because if you can do an Atwood's machine, then, then we just kind of make them harder and more annoying. Not really harder, just more annoying to deal with. Okay, so here we go. This looks good. So what we, what, there's, oh my. There's two ways I can do this. Let's just go with, here's, what, here's the way I do it. I split it in half and I look at this guy and I look at this guy. Now there's another way to do it. You can stretch it. You can say you can do this. You can pretend it's a train, since it's all accelerating in one direction, and you can make the thing in one straight line. I think that that's too confusing for right now. We'll, we'll do that anyway with the math. Now what happens is I've got two systems I'm looking at, so I'm going to wind up with two equations and two unknowns. Just telling you right now because we've got we want to find the tension and we want to find this acceleration that's two unknowns so I better come up with at least two equations all right otherwise I can't solve the system it's got infinite solutions or no solutions Ting has an internal song in her brain there or something I don't know <laughs> that was kind of comical all right now that I've embarrassed her I didn't mean to um, so anyway, <laughs> all right, so let's just take a look at this guy. So let's take a look at the 1.5 kilogram mass. And the, the equation for him is the sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to T, which is going in our positive direction, minus 1.5 G, which is going in the negative direction, equals... 1.5 times A equals mass 1 times A. Now, I know this, but I don't know this, and I don't know that. Okay? I, I, don't, know, I don't know T, and I don't know A, so I can't solve it just yet. All right, so let's look at the 5 kilogram mass. We'll just plug right along, and we'll look at the sum of the forces in the y direction. Second law stuff. These are the sum of the net external force. Yes, Eric? Oh, oh, 1.5 y, or is that a g? That's a g. Okay. Yeah, that's a g. G, g. Yeah, see, this is a y, and this is a g. You can't tell the difference back there? He's a g. Anyway, sorry. All right. Okay. Oh, bringing back my Don Bosco days. My little FOGs. My 5-1 gangsters. Anyway, so we look at this guy, and he's T minus... Now, here's the big deal. It's the big deal thing. All right. Equals... What are we going to do here with this mass time, this 5A? What are we going to do? Make it what? Well, I'm missing something here. I'm missing a mathematical notation here. Which way is that A going? Positive or negative? Negative. 
Okay? Now, if we solve this and we wind up getting a negative a, if we say a equals negative something, then I've got it going the wrong way. All of a sudden, all of our intuition is wrong. It's actually going the other way, which would be way wrong. Okay? So we go, oh, it's going minus 5a. All right, so now, here's what I can do. I can do this. I can say the tension is equal to 5g minus 5a. Right? I just added 5g to both sides. So I wound up with tension equals 5g to 5a. Guess what I'm going to do now? I'm going to put this guy in over here. Put this guy. And so I'll say, all right, so I'm going to take the information I got over here and plug it in over here. So f of y, then for this one, is equal to 5g minus 5a minus uh, 1.5g is equal to 1.5 times a. Let's clean things up here. So I'm going to get uh, 3.5g equals 6.5 times a. And so 3.5g divided by 6.5 equals a. So I found my acceleration, which will be as soon as I find my calculator. I could have sworn I brought a calculator. Did, did I not bring a calculator today? I didn't. I brought in the test. I can only remember two things at once. Oh, thank you, Steve. All right, here we go. So I've got 3.5 times 9.8 equals 34.3 divided by 6.5 equals 5.3. So the acceleration, A is equal to 5.3 meters per second squared. That's what A is. Now I can find T without much trouble. I can either plug it, since I know A, I can, I can, I can plug it in here and solve for T, or I can plug it in here. And, let's just plug it in here since we already got an equation for T here. Let's say t is equal to 5 times 9.8 minus 5 times um, 5.3. Well, that makes my head hurt just looking at it. Oh, but I can do this. I can go 5 times 9.8 minus 5.3. And I wind up with 5 times 4 point, what, 5. Oh, that's almost, I can almost do that. That's 22.5. How, what's the units for tension? It is Newton's. You're right. It's a force. It is a force. Okay. It is Newton's. Right. All right. Now, I got about five minutes or so. I'm going to kind of cheat here a little bit. Because the next example that they gave in the book was really difficult, I thought. But here it is. Are you ready for this? Oh, I probably shouldn't have said that. Now I got you all nervous and upset and everything else. But... I'm just glad Rashonda left her bat up here and it's not next to her. All right, now, um, here's the deal. One more time. Oh boy, 20 degrees. Remember what I've always told you, you can't teach physics without blocks and inclined planes. All right, so now I'm going to put the five kilogram block. This is frictionless. There's no friction on here. All right. It's like a Teflon block, and I'm going to put a block of ice on it, all right? So there's absolutely hardly any friction or no friction. And this is my five-kilogram block now. 
Oh my goodness. And now I'm going to put this pulley like this and put this right here at 1.5 kilograms. Oh my. Now, let's just talk about this conceptually for a minute. There's a tension here, there's a tension here, there's definitely a 1.5 G going this way. Here's my question. Which way is this thing accelerating? Is the 1.5 thing going up or is it going, is it going up or is it actually able to pull this thing down? I think it's probably still going up, maybe. Now, if we had it like this, what if we had it like this? If we had it like this, and this is the 5, and this is the 1.5, and this has friction equals 0, what's going to happen now? Yeah, it's going to go down because there's absolutely, because the net force on this is the tension pulling it that way, which will give it an acceleration going that way. Okay, because that's the net force. That's the net external force. That's the only net external force acting on it. Now, there is an mg going down and a normal force going up, but it's not accelerating up in the air, or it's not, as Michaela was saying earlier, she goes, what happens if a large person sits on that table and it goes crashing through? And it's not crashing through the table, so those, the, the, the y forces are balanced in this case. But over here we have an issue, and this is where I'm going to suspend the talk here in one minute and let you all kind of wrestle with this or you all can put it away and go, I'm not even going to think about it until next Tuesday night. Okay, um, here, here we go. I've got an mg force from the center of gravity, from the center of mass of this thing. I've got an mg, a 5g going down like that. Oh my. I've got things cattywampus, don't I? Here's what we're going to do. When I just look at this side, I'm going to flatten this thing out. I'm going to rotate it down so it's nice and flat. Tension is now going this way. But what happened to this, to this vector here when I, when I put this thing down? What happens to it? When that thing goes down, it goes like that, right? It rotates. So my, G, my 5G is now going like this. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to break him down into his components. All right? He's going to have this guy. This will be MG. And now here, you're going to cuss me. This is going to be bad. All right. This theta... Guess what this angle is? There's only one other angle up here. It's 20 degrees. We could go through the geometric proof of that, but we don't want to just trust me on this. All right? It's 20 degrees. All right? Now, this is along the y-axis. I will buy that. I agree. But what is, this is the adjacent leg, so therefore it's mg is, the, is it the sine or the cosine that I put here? Adjacent angle. Adjacent goes with which? Cosine. Very Right. So, cosine theta. This guy, he's the opposite, so he's the sine. Oh, my. Now, I'm going to take this vector and put him right here. This is my mg sine theta. mg cosine theta is going down, and there's a normal force going up. And here's tension. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay, so now, here we go. When, when students get confused, here's what we do. It's just like when you travel in a foreign country. What do you do? Besides those of you that are from other lands and speak English perfectly. Oh, yeah, by the way, what do you call someone who speaks three languages? 
Trilingual. What do you call someone who speaks two languages? What do you call someone who speaks one language? An American. All right, anyway, so now, um, so anyway, so what do Americans do when we're in a foreign country? All right, we speak slower and louder, and maybe they'll get it. All right, that's what we always do. Show me to, okay, well, now, now that I've scared the hell out of them, I'll really, get, okay, so here we go. I'm going to go slower and louder with this. So I'm going to draw it bigger, okay? So here's what we did. We had this five kilogram thing right here, and this was supposed to be 20 degrees, all right? And we knew that gravity was coming down like this. Ah, that's too steep. Let me not draw it so steep. So we go like this. There's gravity coming straight down. And that's 5G. Okay, then we rotated this thing, and this was 20 degrees. So now we rotated this thing, and basically here's what I want you to do. From now on, we're going to rotate thing. When they're on an incline, we're going to rotate it. All right? We're going to flatten it down. But what happened was when I flatten this down, when I go, so this guy goes like this. So now, this is five kilograms, and this is my 5G force going out like this. I'm taking this 5G force and breaking it down into its components. This one, this is mg cosine theta, because this theta is 20 degrees. So let me just put the 20 here. And then this side, because this is my 90 degree angle, this side is mg sine theta. So basically what I'm doing is, I'm replacing that 5G force with two components. And the reason I'm going to do right now, oh my, I lied to you. I'm going to do right now, and we're not going to solve this, I'm just going to finish setting it up. So the reason is, this guy is the sum of the forces in the X direction, is equal to positive T minus MG sine theta this force, and Robin and Michaela, one of them, Michaela said, this, they think that this thing's probably going to be accelerating this way. So I'm going to say, all right, so now when I flattened it, I said the acceleration is going this way. So that's negative, equals negative, let me put the 5 here so you can see what I'm doing, 5A. Some of the forces in the y direction, I'm not too concerned about because it's not accelerating, um, is equal to zero, which is equal to the normal force, which is positive, minus mg cosine theta. And that equals zero. It's not accelerating. It's, this part is in equilibrium. This part's actually moving at negative 5a. There we go. There, we'll, we'll stop there, and we'll finish this guy. We come back. When I saw the book started with this one, I was like, no, 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 no. We don't want to start there. We want to, we want to end there when, you're, when your brains are completely done. All right, that's it. That's it. Good.